morning, everyone. We are uh, going to look at Brave New World today, uh, the concluding work on the course um, that began in Milton's, with Milton's Paradise Lost and uh, ended in this strange place um, with yet another dystopian novel. I mentioned it last time when we were talking about 1984. And I'm taking them somewhat out of order because this one was published uh, almost 20 years before 1984. And it's uh, interesting that the, there's a pre-existing relationship between the two authors as well, insofar as Huxley was actually Orwell's uh, teacher at Eton College, the famous uh, British uh, public school. By the way, public schools in Britain are the very, very private elite schools. That's what they're called uh, public schools. They're there for um, educating those who will be in the public service mostly. Uh, uh, so wealthy sons of the wealthy and uh, uh, the political class, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, I'm going to read you an extract, or actually I might even put up the letter that uh, Huxley wrote to Orwell about Orwell's 1984, and uh, the commentary is interesting as a, as a way of reading uh, Huxley's own work and what he believes he's doing there. But what I want to say to you at the outset is that both men have a view of a future that is totalitarian, in which uh, everything is being controlled uh, totally. And uh, that uh, commitment to efficiency, which we noted on the course uh, back in a modest proposal, and then mentioned explicitly as the distinctive mark of uh, Western nation states and their scramble for Africa. It's what distinguished us from the Romans is our commitment to efficiency, uh, says Marlowe in Heart of Darkness. And um, I've been trying to demonstrate on the course, as part of the whole worldview orientation, the, the shift. I mean, w when we think about uh, Western culture, we've been dealing with Western culture. There are other cultures that we could deal with, but it would be impossible to do that and, and to really, under, without first understanding our own culture and what happens in it. And uh, what's characteristic about it and what, what we can actually note as um, strengths and weaknesses. And uh, f to my mind, there's certainly evidence of the latter, at least in the novels and the poetry uh, from the Enlightenment period onward. A strong voice from poets and novelists and dramatists, for that matter, that uh, all is not right in the way that um, our world uh, looks at the world and how it acts in relation to it. So the modern uh, movements uh, which are, who, who are suspicious of, of those in authority, those in power, are not new to the game. Uh, the, the, the critique uh, from within uh, the establishment, if you take as the establishment the celebrated novelists and poets and dramatists and musicians and artists, um, seems to long predate the development of Marxism and feminism and queer theory and so forth. It, it goes long before that. Um, and, um, and it has a different tenor than theirs. Their tenor, those worldviews, the postmodern literary theories I just mentioned, basically are resigned to the idea that um, everything's about power and nothing but power. And uh, that there is no God, furthermore. The, all these theories won't even consider that the created order is God's created order and that he remains sovereign over it. And that we can look at it from that vantage point and critique it. And that's what I've been trying to do on the course in a very small way, is to suggest that um, even the novelists, although they're often prophetic, don't see the whole picture. Uh, and they don't see it from a Christian point of view, certainly. Um, and that's what I've tried to, to add as some value on the course is uh, the idea that 
we don't have to agree um, with the writers, but we do have to see the, uh, their perspicacity on certain things, their uh, awareness of issues that their contemporaries seem to miss, and then they write fiction that seems to symbolize uh, the conflicts and struggles in a way that just captures it. If you read the statistics, uh, a study of the period, it would tell you certain things, but it doesn't really give you the big picture. And the novelists and the poets and the dramatists encapsulate it in a story in a way that we can, uh, we can understand it and, and relate to it, which is why I think from the early beginnings, um, this is how people have tried to understand the world around them. They write stories. And the stories encapsulate a great deal more truth than, than they appear to. They're not just entertainment, in other words. And uh, that idea of the function of art being there not only to delight but to teach goes back as far as scripture, uh, but we can even see it on the first work I did on, on the course last semester, if you were with me, and some of you were, uh, Homer's Odyssey, the importance of storytelling. and uh, and. Uh, leading by example, uh, which we saw all the way back with uh, Odysseus and uh, his son Telemachus, who was left without a father for 20 years. And a mentor came forward to offer up a, a moral example of, example of how to behave as a man, and he didn't have one. And one of the things he did, and one of the things Athena did, the goddess of wisdom, is to recount the story of one of the heroes from the, the Battle of Troy, his name is Agamemnon, who returned home and then was murdered by uh, his wife and her lover. And that was a, a sort of a cautionary tale for Odysseus. When you go home, it's 20 years on, don't assume that everything's going to be right. You need to be cautious, be wise in how you proceed. And the, the, for the audience, Homer's audience, who's hearing this story retold, it's being instructed in the ways in which the world is often treacherous and subtle and we need wisdom to navigate it. Um, so when we come to Brave New World, I think that the story here is a story. It's obviously a, as I say, dystopian. It's a, it's a, hor it's a rather horrifying view of the, of the future, uh, not exactly contemporary commentary, but he sees it as part of a trajectory of the way that the world is evolving. And he writes it in 1932. Well, what happens in, what's happening in 1932? Not much, actually. If, if you looked at the news reports from 1932, um, the Great Depression hasn't even happened. Uh, Nazi Germany does not yet exist. The Weimar Republic, which uh, succeeded the um, fall of Kaiser Wilhelm in Germany, um, gave way to a republic, uh, and uh, they suffered a great deal. There's no doubt about that. So in Germany, the story would be of economic ruin, uh, huge degrees of inflation so that the, the money that they were printing uh, was basically worthless. Um, there was nothing behind it, and they had to print larger and larger notes. Like you start with a dollar, and then ends up being a million dollars, and the mil million dollars is worth less than the dollar used to be a few weeks before. So hyperinflation, and that leads to mass starvation and all sorts of things. At the same time, uh, in the Weimar Republic, there's no commitment. Um, the education uh, of the young is, uh, and the young are increasingly. Uh, believing that there's no real ultimate value and there's sort of a, a nihilism has crept in. Um, but in, well, Huxley's writing in Britain, Britain won the war. Um, they rather, their, their view of the future is not very bleak at all, but he sees something about uh, the seeds of totalitarian woven into uh, his own country and other countries around it because it's not just a story of Britain, it's a brave new world. It's the whole world that he depicts here. Uh, in the same way that Huck, um, rather Heart of Darkness seems to have a global stage, in this case it's Africa, but Europe dealing with Africa, uh, 
here too, he's writing about as an Englishman with an with you know it's an English novel, but he seems to be talking about globalism, and a certain type of globalism, one committed to efficiency. And science, and progress, and uh, with that he shares a lot in common with uh, 1984, and the two novels are often compared and contrasted. So, as I say, when I was uh, in school, I, I read both novels in the same year, in grade 12 it was. And um, there are differences between the two. Let me look to that. And actually, a good way of introducing it is actually looking to Orwell's own letter, or rather Huxley's letter to Orwell. I have it on the screen behind me, so it's probably worth looking at. Yeah, this is good enough. And I'm gonna, I, I want to make a few comments on it because I think the, the, the letter is very uh, astute and, and very, uh, it's a good critique. But again, remember this is to Orwell about his novel 1984 and Huxley himself has already written Brave New World and Huxley was also his English teacher, taught him literature in high school. Now he's gone on, one of his students has gone on to write a great novel <coughs> and at this time Orwell is also a well-known journalist. So he writes this to him as former teacher to student. Mr. Orwell, dear Mr. Orwell, it was very kind of you to tell your publishers, let me see, I'll put it in front of me rather than read behind you, um, to send a copy of your book. It arrived as I was in the midst of a piece of work that required much reading and consulting of references. And since poor sight makes it necessary for me to ration my reading, I had to wait a long time before being able to embark on 1984. Agreeing with all that the critics have written of it, I need not tell you, yet once more, how fine and how profoundly important the book is. May I speak instead of the thing with which the book deals, the ultimate revolution. The first hints of a philosophy of the ultimate revolution, the revolution which lies beyond politics and economics, and which aims at total subversion of the individual's psychology and physiology are to be found in the Marquis de Sade, who regarded himself as the continuator, the consummator of Robespierre and Babeuf, French Revolution. The philosophy of the ruling minority in 1984 is a sadism, that is Orwell's novel, a sadism which has been carried out to its logical conclusion by going beyond sex and denying it. Whether in actual fact the policy of the boot on the face can go on indefinitely seems doubtful. My own belief is that the ruling oligarchy will find less arduous and wasteful ways of governing and of satisfying its lust for power. And these ways will resemble those which I described in Brave New World. So he's talking about his own novel here. I have had occasion recently to look into the history of animal magnetism and hypnotism and have been greatly struck by the way in which for 150 years the world has refused to take serious cognizance of the discoveries of Mesmer, Braid, Esdale and the rest. Partly because of the prevailing materialism and partly because of prevailing respectability, 19th century philosophers and men of science were not willing to investigate the odder facts of psychology for practical men, such as politicians, soldiers, and policemen, to apply in the field of government. Thanks to the voluntary ignorance of our fathers, the advent of the ultimate revolution was delayed for five or six generations. Another luck lucky accident was Freud's inability to hypnotize successfully and his consequent disparagement of hypnotism. This delayed the general application of hypnotism to psychiatry for at least 40 years. But now psychoanalysis is being combined with hypnosis and hypnosis has been made easy and indefinitely extensible through the use of barbiturates, barbiturates which induce a hypnoid and suggestible state in even the most recalcitrant subjects. In other words, chemicals, drugs. 
Within the next generation, I believe that the world's powers will discover that infant conditioning and narco hypnosis are more efficient as instruments of government than clubs and prisons, and that the lust for power can just as completely be satisfied by suggesting people into loving their servitude as by flogging and kicking them into obedience. In other words, I feel that the nightmare of 1984 is destined to modulate into the nightmare of a world having more resemblance to that which I imagine in Brave New World. The change will be brought about as a result of a felt need for increased efficiency. Note, a felt need for increased efficiency. Meanwhile, of course, there may be a large-scale biological and atomic war, in which case we shall have nightmares of other and scarcely imaginable kinds. Thank you once again for the book. talks about atomic war. The, at the atom bomb was dropped in 1945. Research on it happen happening uh, and uh, not only happening, but has transpired by the time he has written this. So the real threat of atomic war, chemical war, etc., uh, the backdrop, uh, against which he writes this letter. So lots of history going on in, the, in that. Um, so some very interesting observations here, but effectively it comes down to the question of which one, uh, which dystopian view of the future. They're agreed that the, the future will be like this. So note that, that when they're writing this, these two novels, they're really departing uh, from even what we saw in uh, A Modest Proposal. I don't think that uh, Swift really imagined that anyone would take up his suggestion and start uh, breeding babies and fattening them up so that they become good food and you'd make a profit on it. Right? I don't, there's, it's a satire. There's great irony in it. It's, it's dystopian in the sense that the proposal is preposterous and appalling. It uh, contradicts their understanding of what human nature is. It contradicts their whole understanding of, of charity, of loving your neighbor as yourself and so forth. It's, it's there. That's the backdrop for uh, the satire of the 18th century. It's still early stages of the Age of Enlightenment in which they do regard even the Catholics as human beings. That's the core assumption. So you can't just do whatever you want with human beings. You have to treat them with dignity and respect. And the reason why Modest Proposal works is because the proposal suggests that they're not worthy of dignity and respect. And we, the reader, are supposed to realize, huh, I think we need to change our policies. Right? So that's there. Come the 19th century, we see a progression on that and a, and a development which is altogether alarming. Uh, people are regarding their material needs as their only needs, their primary needs. So they deny the reality of death in the death of Ivan Illich. They live as, this, as if this life were the only life that they could ever lead. And death was something that we could just forget about until it comes. And when it comes, we'll still forget about it act as if nothing's happened here, um, and live a, an efficient life on, on gaining um, pleasure. So in a sense, moving in Huxley's direction. Right? That's what Ivan lives his life for. That's what those in his little novella leave their lives for. And in uh, Heart of Darkness, the whole of the continent is committed to the same sort of ostentatious wealth. Uh, and uh, is willing to do anything to do it, and including abandon its own ethical standards because we're no longer in Europe. We're in Africa, and here we can do whatever we want, and nobody's going to hold us accountable. And that's what happens to Kurtz. All right? Kurtz realizes that he has absolute power there, and all he needs to do is terrorize the locals into cowering submission and they will do whatever he wants and what he wants is just to have the ivory for himself and what the company says is so beyond uh, beyond the pale is that he's doing it for himself and not doing it for them they didn't care about his methods before you know ex killing the Africans doing anything to get more ivory that's all good that's that's good you're you're a good 
practitioner of the company's values. But as soon as he used it for his own selfish motives, they said, you can't do that, as if there were an ethical objection. And so they send Marlowe in to go get him. But Marlowe admires his commitment to efficiency and above all, that he doesn't hold himself to standards of good and evil. He's beyond good and evil. He is the Ubermensch. He is the future. And he's willing to brutalize other people in part because he doesn't even see them as other people. And Marlowe, in his depiction of the Africans, describes them in terms that are little more than animalistic. Right? And so, again, some critics have said this is, you know, the depiction of the Africans is contemptible. And of course it is. And that's the point. We're again, I think Conrad is still close enough to the spirit of the Enlightenment to make us want to see a critique of colonialism in the portrait of other human beings as subhuman. But it is in keeping with the views of Darwinism. Survival of the fittest. Seeing everyone as group, members of a group, uh, identity group, a tribe, whatever. It's the European tribe. And they are more civilized because they have more power. And they will, in a sense, show their commitment to what uh, here Orwell calls the uh, commitment to the ultimate revolution, which lies beyond economics and politics, which aims at the total subversion of the individual psychology and physiology found in the Marquis de Sade, the sadist. Uh, the Marquis de Sade, notorious for his brutal uh, sexual behavior, torturing other people, gaining delight from it. Um, so we're moving, moving there, but we haven't got to the point where it is the, the prime motive, just simply power for the sake of power. But come the 20th century, both authors see this now as the prime motive. And um, so when uh, there's a contemporary writer by the name of Michel Foucault, he's, when I say contemporary, he's dead now. Uh, I think he died in 1984 even. Have you heard of Mark, uh, Michel Foucault? And I mean, maybe good that you haven't. Um, but he is the most uh, influential intellectual in the past 30 years in the, in the academy. A uh, gay man, died of AIDS. Um, don't need to get too much into his uh, personal uh, biography here, but um, wrote books advancing the idea that all uh, politics is effectively just the pursuit of power on the behalf of a particular group, the ruling class. So very much in keeping with what Orwell is saying about totalitarian societies and what Huxley is saying about them, they're all in agreement on this. And the question then for the Christian audience and for others who are not simply willing to accept that that is so, is, is there another way of looking at authority? Is there a right use of authority? Do people, even the elites, have all the power? We know that they may want the power. They may be motivated by that. Do they actually have the first and last word on everything? Because if you look at the history of totalitarianism in the, in the 20th century, um, Hitler began a thousand year Reich. At, when the Nazi party came into power in Germany, it was the beginning of a thousand year Reich, a reign, a rule, like an empire. It was gone within 10 years. Totally collapsed, destroyed. Probably uh, destroyed itself as much as it was destroyed by the Allies. They, it's extraordinary the things that the Nazis did to themselves and Hitler did to his own people. Um, but evil, gone within 10 years. The communists who were there at the same time uh, with the Iron Curtain, the Soviet Union, it looked like it was going to be there again for our generations. Uh, I couldn't imagine it when I grew up in 1984 that the Soviet Union would end, but in 1989, the Berlin Wall fell. 
and it was all it came down like a house of cards it was over the political manifestations of communism like that it just fell it was gone so the the idea that um, there is this uh, Babylon the Great if you will which is inevitably going to rule and there will be no end to its rule and it seems to be manifested in the power of Nazi Germany or in the communist uh, coalition of the Soviet Union and all its satellite uh, communist states um, seems to belied, be belied by history itself. Like these th things do come down, they come to an end. And so then the question is, and was that not a good thing when they did come down? Because I think everybody tends to say, yes, that was a good thing. Actually speak to somebody from Eastern Europe and ask them whether they think it's a good thing that communism ended. And I think you, all, you almost always get the answer, oh yes, it was a great evil. Likewise, if you speak to Germans, Germans about what they think about Nazi Germany, they will almost always tell you that it was extraordinarily wicked and it was right that it ended. And, and it did end. And so justice and goodness did prevail over it. Well, the portrait of Brave New World in 1984 suggests that that can't happen. So the dystopian portrait that we're reading here, uh, which seems to be not only uh, about those regimes, but predictive of the future, including our future, I think we need to have, take it with a bit of a grain of salt and recognize that there is a power greater than that of the totalitarian regimes in this world. I think it's God. I think he works in all manner of ways. And one of them is he brings down empires and rulers, even totalitarian ones. Still, that's, this is the backdrop for um, this final story. And then the question is, at least one of the questions that I have is which one of the two men are closer to seeing the way the future will pan out? Uh, we looked at Orwell first, and I think we could easily see that it was, n it was a very bleak picture. It was, again, the jackboot on the face. St uh, a boot stamping on a human face forever. Again, forever is the emphasis here. Total efficiency. No tolerance of dissent. Is it going to be brutal like that? Is it going to be sadistic? He, he applauds Orwell for seeing the fruits of the, this being rooted to the revolutionary ideals of the French Revolution, destroying all authority uh, and subverting it and replacing it, but ultimately all authority includes the integrity of the human person itself. The authority of God over humanity is going to have to be eradicated with a step on the face of humanity. That's how it's going to have to happen because it's not enough to say we're atheists. We also have to take, get rid of every sign that a human being bears the image of God. All reality that the party doesn't determine has to be eradicated. So he applauds him for this. He says, this is exactly what marks totalitarian societies. They want absolute control. And in Orwell, I think it's fantastic to observe how aware he is that language is a part of that, controlling language and people's thoughts. Um, it's something that I don't think Huxley is nearly as good at observing. Total control over the, over the past as a way of controlling the future. Um, so that's the brutal way of, of observing it. But Huxley presents it in a different way, and he, he mentions it. I, I imagine it in a way in which the people are made agreeable to what happens to them, not brutalized and terrorized into a, to compliance, but will willingly give themselves up and be happy with it furthermore. They won't even recognize it. And uh, I'll look at the beginning of the novel that will sort of illustrate this. Oops, that's not it. That's not it either. That's it. And maybe I'll pull this up so you can see it entirely. 
There you go. Um, it's another dystopian novel. It, the, it's a nightmarish vision of a future society. Uh, the setting is 2540. So it's not 1984. This is a long way off. Uh, 2540 is the year AF 632. What is AF? It's after Ford. Ford, the automaker, uh, the automaker who creates the assembly line, the mechanical, the mechanistic process whereby each individual produces just a part and the part then gets, and you, if you do it in assembly, you can build a car very quickly. And you can have any color you want for car, your car as long as it's black. Right? So there's a uniformity about it, there's a mechanism about it, there's an efficiency about it, and, uh, and it can be done at a very low cost. So this is the way of the future, and uh, Huxley, plainly in 1932, with the Model T Ford in mind, sees that this, what's being done with the car, will eventually be done with the human beings. That's the point. And it's 632 years after the assembly line approach to production, which will now include human beings. And uh, Ford himself is seen as the sort of messianic figure. AF 632, well, that would be like AD. AD, Anno Domini, by the way, the year of our Lord. So this is the turning point of history for this futuristic society. Uh, the futuristic society is called a world state, furthermore. So if you want to look back at what we saw last time with the... Uh, or last time, a few classes ago, with Heart of Darkness, where the European powers were putting their colonies all over and identifying themselves as part of their different empires. This has now been extended so that the whole globe is one bunch of separate states that are effectively global, connected in a certain way. And they are revolving around science and efficiency. They believe in science. That is their religion. Science is their religion. Now, when we say science is their religion, let me say, um, science is not their religion in the sense that they uh, believe that science gives us an understanding of the world around us, but rather that they are committed to what the scientists say science is. And the scientists are no longer motivated by knowledge, but rather by power and by control. So. It's the difference between science and scientism, which is so much a part of our contemporary world. When people say, you know, you just trust the science, or I'm the chief, you know, the chief doctor for the province of Ontario or Canada or whatever, uh, some bureaucrat at the top of the chain is say, well, I trust the science. Uh, I trust the science as well. I don't necessarily trust the scientist's view of what science is. particularly um, in the midst of a trial phase, right? So there are two different types of science. There's the observable science that's part of the scientific method of the 17th century, trial and error, the Royal Society. And then there's historical science, which is the, the way in which science looks at itself and calls this the path of science. The latter can be dependent on ideology and power. The fact that uh, if I drop a pebble and it hits the ground, we can observe uh, gravity, that's the first type of science. That's observable, it doesn't change. That is actually science. But the appeal to the authority of the scientists as leading the future, that's what Huxley is depicting. So it's a certain view of science that they are um, presenting, and it is one in which science is idealized and idolized for, furthermore. Science and efficiency. And in that society, and I'm going to get to this in a minute and how it's depicted in chapter one, individuals are conditioned out of children at a young age. All the emotions and individuality are taken from people. Or rather, not taken from them, conditioned out of them. What do I mean by conditioning? Do you know? What, what do I mean by conditioning? Anyone doing psychology? 
Yeah, what, a, any s suggestion? Yes, yeah. So who, who would be the primary um, psychologist we'd associate with stimulus and response and training? Pavlov, sure. So you can do certain things, Pavlov's dog. You can train the dog and the, the experiment was you know, ringing the bell and you, he observes that the, cat, the, the gastric um, system responded to the ringing of the bell because the ringing of the bell was followed by food all the time, right? So there's literally, oh, when that bell rings, I know food's coming. So the dog very excited and starts already salivating, tastes it. And you can condition that and you can do it both ways, positively and negatively. With the carrot and the stick, in the case of the dog, you give it the, the Pavlovs, it's giving him the carrot, but you can do it the other way as well. Uh, I think both men are talking about a society that's conditioned. Or, well, it's conditioned by the stick. You can beat people down so that they will do what you want. You can break them. Torture. That's, that's how Orwell depicted it. It's the, Huxley imagines it through the carrot. And his objection to uh, Orwell is not that you're wrong about your analysis of the sadism in the uh, scientists and bureaucrats and technocrats. It's that I don't think that's, it's just, I don't think that's how they're going to do it. I think they're going to use a carrot, not a stick. But he still thinks they're, they're all sadists and they're all doing experiments on the populace. And it's just that this will be more efficient. That's, at the end of the day, which, which of the two approaches is more efficient? People that go, go along with you or people that are effectively against you that you have to beat down? And he thinks that the carrot will work better because they'll go along with it willingly. And the, re the way in which they do this is they condition, uh, as I say, their emotions and individuality out of them very young. And they take, there's no families. They take them away from their mothers and fathers so that they don't develop attachments, emotional attachments, uh, to any person other than themselves. They all feel isolated as individuals and they're all looked after by the state. And the state gives them everything they want. It makes them happy. Cradle to grave. And the, the dogma is uh, because everyone belongs to everyone else, which they then demonstrate uh, in terms of the uh, sexual ethics. Everyone belongs to, any, uh, to everyone else. So what we begin with here in chapter one is uh, a... Uh, Ex a, a scientific and compartmentalized version of society, a lab which represents the whole of the state. So it begins in a lab. It's funny, where does this novel begin? It begins in a lab, but the lab represents the whole. It's a microcosm. So it's symbolic of the whole novel. What it's doing to the hat those in the hatchery, this is called the Central London Hatchery and Conditioning Center, is the whole of what the whole world state is doing. And we are introduced to a class system, of course. It's Huxley, so he imagines everything in terms of class. The British see things through the, 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 the lens of class, the Americans through that of race. Everything's racism. In the, U in the UK, it's all about class. In Canada, we get the worst of both worlds. We, we think both. <laughs> it's class and race. Anyway, let me get, I'll start the reading here. Uh, a squat gray building of only 34 stories. Note that it's gray again. Over the main entrance, the words Central London Hatchery and Conditioning Center, and in a shield, the world state's motto, community, identity, stability. The enormous room on the ground floor faced toward the north, cold for all the summer beyond the panes, for all the tropical heat of the room itself. A harsh, thin light glared through the windows, hungrily seeking some draped lay figure, some pallid shape of academic goose flesh. 
but finding only the glass and nickel and bleakly shining porcelain of a laboratory. Wintriness responded to wintriness. The overalls of the workers were white, their hands gloved with a pale corpse-colored rubber. The light was frozen, dead, a ghost. Only from the yellow barrels of the microscopes did it borrow a certain rich and living substance, lying among the polished tubes like butter, streak after luscious streak in a long recession toward the work tables. So this is just uh, the scenery. It's describing the scenery. Note that it's, it's, it's clinical, it's scientific, it's abstract, it's inhumane. It's not, there's nothing human about it and relatively colorless for that matter. One final thing I, I neglected to say, the title, Brave New World, he's taken this from Shakespeare. Shakespeare's um, Prospero in, um, oh gosh, what's the name of the, uh, of the play? I don't know Shakespeare's Prospero, come on, The Tempest which is a utopian novel. It's an idea of an ideal uh, human republic. What brave new world that there be such men as these, says Miranda, actually. And so he's taken that, those three words from that line from Miranda, marveling about the future men that would be like this, and he's put it in a dystopian context. So he's explicitly making the comparison for uh, his readership. Anyway, and this, said the director opening the door, is the fertilizing room. Note that it's called a hatchery, and this is the fertilizing room. Uh, in uh, a modest proposal, we use the language of breeders and dams and sires and so forth, right? Reference to animals. What do we have here as the comparative metaphor? Yes? Uh, birds. birds. And you fertilize them. You fertilize the eggs. So it's, it's taking it back even closer. It's not just dealing with the male and the female of the species because it has a stronger understanding of biology and microbiology. So oh, we'll get it down to the sperm and the egg. We'll take it there. But, so it's just more efficient. It's a better understanding of things, but it's effectively the same sort of thing. This is the fertilizing room, bent over their instruments. 300 fertilizers were plunged as the director of hatcheries and conditioning entered the room in the scarcely breathing silence. The absent-minded soliloquiz soliloquizing hum or whistle of absorbed concentration. A troop of newly arrived students, very young, pink and callow, followed nervously, rather ad abjectly at the director's heels. Each of them carried a notebook in which, whenever the great man spoke, he desperately scribbled. Straight from the horse's mouth, it was a rare privilege. The DHC for Central London always made a point of personally conducting his new students round the various departments. Just to give you a general idea, he would explain to them. For of course, some sort of general idea they must have if they were to do their work intelligently, though as little of one if they were to be good and happy members of society as possible. So he wants to tell them a little bit about what's going on, but not too much. Only for the sake of efficiency do they need to understand, get the big picture. Uh, nothing more than that. If they get more than that, then they can become critical. So, For particulars, as everyone knows, make for virtue and happiness. Generalities are intellectually necessary evils. By the way, there's great irony in this. It's, this is not what Huxley would believe. It's the generals that make for virtue virtues and happiness. Justice is a general concept, not a particular concept. Same with goodness and beauty and truth. These things are common to everyone and can be understood as universals. So it shows how inverted the world is in his uh, description here. Not philosophers, but fret sawers and stamp collectors compose the backbone of society. That's how bad things are. Tomorrow, he would add, smiling at them with a slightly menacing geniality, you'll be settling, settling down to serious work. You won't have time for generalities. Meanwhile, meanwhile, it was a privilege. 
straight from the horse's mouth into the notebook. The boys scribbled like mad. Tall and rather thin, but upright, the director advanced into the room. He had a long chin and big, rather prominent teeth, just covered when he was not talking by his full, floridly curved lips. Old, young, 30, 50, 55, it was hard to say. And anyhow, the question didn't arise in this year of stability, AF 632. Didn't occur to you to ask it. I shall begin at the beginning, said the DHC. And the more zealous students recorded his intention in their notebooks. Begin at the beginning. These, he waved his hand, are the incubators. And opening an insulated door, he showed them racks upon racks of numbered test tubes. The week's supply of ova. Kept, he explained, at blood heat. Whereas the male gametes, and there he opened another door, they have to be kept at 35 instead of 37. Full blood heat sterilizes. Rams wrapped in thermogene beget no rams. See, it has to be a little bit cooler. The sperm don't survive in the heat of body temperature. You're wondering why the testes drop down and so forth. That's why. You're not wondering. <laughs> That's what he's explaining. You weren't wondering that at all. Still leaning against the incubators, he gave them, while the pencils scurried illegibly across the pages, a brief description of the modern fertilizing process. Spoke first, of course, of its surgical introduction. The operation undergone voluntarily for the good of society, not to mention the fact that it carries a bonus amounting to six months' salary, continued with some account of the technique for preserving the excised ovary alive, so you take the ovaries out of the female, and actively developing, passed on to a consideration of optimum temperature, salinity, viscosity, referred to the liquor in which the detached and ripened eggs were kept, and leading his charges to the work tables, actually showed them how this liquor was drawn off from the test tubes, how it was let out drop by drop on the specifically warm slides of the microscopes, how the eggs which it contained were inspected for abnormalities, counted and transferred to a porous receptacle, how, and he now took them to watch the operation, this receptacle was immersed in a warm bouillon containing free swimming spermatozoa at a minimum concentration of 100,000 per cubic centimeter, he insisted. And how after 10 minutes, the container was lifted out of the liquor and its contents re-examined. How, if any of the eggs remained unfertilized, it was again immersed, and if necessary, yet again. How the fertilized ova went back to the incubators, where the alphas and betas remained until definitely bottled, while the gammas, deltas, and epsilons were brought out again after only 36 hours to undergo Bokhanovsky's process. Bokhanovsky's process, repeated the director, and the students underlined the words in their little notebooks. One egg, one embryo, one adult, normality. But a bokhanovsky egg will bud, will proliferate, will divide. So it becomes a twin, a triplet, a quadruplet, so forth. From eight to 96 buds, and every bud will grow into a perfectly formed embryo, and every embryo into a full-size adult, making 96 human beings where only one grew before. Progress. Okay. So what he depicts here, in the case of the, the non-alphas and the betas, this is the gammas, deltas, and epsilon, is a process of making individuals into a... Uh, losing their identity just by replicating them. They don't understand, uh, uh, Huxley doesn't understand genetics here. No discovery of genetics at that point. Um, and so the, the way in which individuals differentiate themselves, he thinks can be enacted in this sort of uh, chemicalized way. They won't, talk, they won't think about gene replacement and gene editing and all that, which is in CRISPR technology now, where, which is actually a, a real thing. 
uh, or let alone sex selection and so forth. So you can know, oh, this is, this is a male, this is a female, N no understanding of that here. That'll be a later development, but it, does it contradict the basic approach of what we see here, which is eugenics? That's what this is. And the eugenics movement is there to develop a human being uh, void of the imperfections that come from the fall. So the genetic copying mistakes that come from the process of um, sexual reproduction and, and just living. You get copying mistakes. This is why you grow old. And this is why you eventually die. Your, your body, which was not made to die, eventually does die. You ever thought about in, uh, in scripture how Abraham's wife, Sarah, uh, how the uh, king of Egypt at the time was so interested in her, wanted her as part of his harem. You ever thought about that? I mean, she's nine years old. Can you really imagine? I don't know if you have a nine-year-old grandma, but the, but the, but the <laughs> prince of a, of a vast uh, kingdom saying, I like the look of you. I want you in my, in my harem. She doesn't look 90. She's going to live for several hundred years. Genetic entropy has not happened to the degree closer to Adam and Eve. That's a product of the fall. Entropy, the, people get worse and worse, genetically speaking, over the course of time. For me, it's one of the demonstrations of, of the fall of humanity, is that people don't get better, they actually get worse, physically speaking. We can see it in our own lives. We reach a sort of a peak when we're adults and then we start to deteriorate. Because of, again, copying mistakes within our own bodies. They start to fall apart. Here it's not, they don't understand the genetic aspect of it and so they see uh, the conditioning that will take place as an external thing rather than within the actual uh, genetic process. But the progress is in these, this so-called Bokanovsky's process and now you get 96 where you once would have had one. It's the assembly line approach. You get more bang for your buck. There was a there was a sperm, there was an egg, but now we got 96, and they're all the same. And there's a loss of identity that goes with it, an individuality that goes with it. This is seen as a sign of progress. Note that it happens to the lower uh, strata of society. So not the alphas and the betas. Those are going to be the future rulers. We only need so many of those. But the gammas, the deltas, the epsilons, we can... We can uh, replicate them because they are going to be used in occupations where their individuality is going to be undermined and they won't object to it too much if they have less sense less of a sense of their individuality not only are we going to take them away from their families they won't even think as an individual they particularly matter they'll see themselves as part of an identity group what's the identity group the epsilons i'm an epsilon essentially balkanov's Bokhanovskification consists of a series of arrests of development. We check the normal growth and paradoxically enough, the egg responds by budding. Responds by budding. The pencils were busy. He pointed on a very slowly moving band. A rack full of test tubes was entering a large metal box. Another rack full was emerging. Machinery faintly purred. It took eight minutes for the tubes to go through. He told them, eight minutes of hard x-rays, being about as much as an egg can stand. So what are they doing? They're degrading the uh, fertilized egg, subjecting it to x-rays, not killing it, but making it less capable of functioning, as it would naturally. A few died, of the rest, the least suscept susceptible, divided into two, most put out four buds, some eight, all were returned to the incubators where the buds began to develop. Then, after two days, were suddenly chilled, chilled, and checked. Two, four, eight, the buds in their turn budded, and having budded, were dosed almost to death with alcohol. Now we give them the old fetal alcohol syndrome. So they're deliberately making these uh, people less capable of functioning as individuals in all of their 
capacities what you would, which you would expect from an individual human being. And after that, further arrest being generally fatal left to develop in peace. Okay, we're not going to do it anymore because basically it kills them all off. Otherwise, we would do it more. Sadism. Torturing the human being. It's part of the revolution. It's gaining power over what? Not against the king, but against God and against the image bearer. Human beings. We have to control that. We need to make it subject to our power. We'll do it right from neonatal conditioning. By which time the original egg was in a fair way to develop and become anything from eight to 96 embryos, a prodigious improvement, you will agree on nature. Identical twins, but not in piddling twos and threes as the old viviparous days. When an egg would so so sometimes accidentally divide, actually by dozens, by scores at a time. Scores! The director repeated and flung out his arms as though he were distributing largesse. Scores! But one of the students was fool enough to ask him where the advantage lay. My good boy! The director wheeled sharply round on him. Can't you see? Can't you see? He raised his hand. His expression was solemn. Bokhanovsky's process is one of the major instruments of social stability. Major instruments of social stability, they write down. Standard men and women in uniform batches. The whole of a small factory staffed with the products of a single Bokhanovsky egg. So they, can, they have a uniformity about them. They're not individuals. They're not distinctive. They're not marked by their family background. They're not marked by their rational faculties. They're marked by the process of the laboratory and the scientist. That's what gives them their nature now. 96 identical twins working 96 identical machines. The voice was almost tremulous with enthusiasm. You really know where you are. For the first time in history, he quoted the planetary motto. Community, identity, stability. Grand words. If we could Bokhanovskify indefinitely, the whole problem would be solved. The whole problem of what? Instability. Uh, objection to the rule of the authorities. The whole problem. What's the whole problem? That we might lose power. People would object to the treatment of the unborn, the way we're treating the unborn. Again, the eugenics movement, taking control over human nature. Solved by standard gammas, unvarying deltas, uniform epsilons, millions of identical twins, the principle of mass production at last applied to biology. But alas, the director shook his head, we can't Bokhanov, Bokhanovskify indefinitely. Too bad. 96 seems to be the limit. 72 a good average. From the same ovary with, and with gametes of the same male to manufacture as many batches of identical twins as possible. That was the best. Sadly, a second best that they can do. And even that was difficult. For in, mature, in nature, it takes 30 years for 200 eggs to reach maturity. But our business is to stabilize the population at this moment, here and now. Dribbling out twins over a quarter of a century, what would be the use of that? Obviously no use at all. What would the, what's the use even in this case? Political stability. That's the use. But Podsnap's technique had immensely accelerated the process of ripening. They could make sure of at least 150 mature eggs within two years. Fertilize and Bokhanovskify. In other words, multiply by 72, and you get an average of nearly 11,000 brothers and sisters in 150 batches of identical twins, all within two years of the same age. That's a lot of people all at once. And they are identified, you, you look at them and you know who they are, because they are identical. You can see them, they look the same. Uh, 
Today, in identity group politics, you talk about race and gender and sexual orientation, all that sort of stuff. Here, it's even to the point where an individual looks exactly the same as all of that. That's what's in view. But it's a, a literally an identity group that has no distinctions between them. Because when you get to the question of race, it's really problematic. You can say somebody's black, and it's like there's a lot of gradations in the description of somebody as black, like a lot. But here it's not. It's you really, this is a real identity group. They are the same, identical. So that's what it's moving towards, and that's what he's describing here. Uh, and in exceptional cases, we can make one over yield as over 15,000 adult individuals. Beckoning to a fair-sized, ruddy young man who happened to be passing at the moment, Mr. Foster, he called, the ruddy young man approached. Can you tell us the record for a single ovary, Mr. Foster? 16,012 in this center, Mr. Foster replied without hesitation. He spoke very quickly, had a vivacious blue eye, and took an evident pleasure in quoting figures. Remember in uh, Modest Proposal, again, mention of statistics as a way of gaining control over reality and of reducing the humanity to the control of those in authority. 16,012 in 189 batches of identicals. But of course, they've done much better, he rattled on, in some of the tropical centers. Singapore has often produced over 16,500. And Mombasa has actually touched the 17,000 mark. But then they have unfair advantages. You should see the way a Negro ovary responds to pituitary. It's quite astonishing. When you're used to working with the European material. Still, he added with a laugh, but the light of combat was in his eyes and the lift of his chin was challenging. Still, we mean to beat them if we can. I'm working on a wonderful delta minus ovary at this moment only just 18 months old. Over 12,700 children already either decanted or in embryo and still going strong. We'll beat them yet. So it's an arms race, not a nuclear arms race. It's a biological arms race. They're going to produce babies on a mass scale and there are different uh, world empires at this race to control human nature. And so we're introduced, as I say, to uh, a class system which is chemically conditioned before they're even born. And we'll meet uh, very shortly Bernard Marx. He's an alpha, one of the main characters in the story. Not a hero, by the way, but one of the main characters in the story because there are no heroes in the story, per se. Anyway. Um, I think that's sufficient of that description here. Um, but all of this is a description of what goes on in the, uh, the London, uh, what is it, the London, what's it called again? Oops the London Center of the London, Central London Hatchery and Conditioning Center, working under the world motto. Um, what do I want to say here? But why do you keep, want to keep the embryo below par? Asked an ingenious student. Because some of them are being deliberately kept from full excellence. Why would you want this? Is the question. Like, why not make uh, multiple, like 16,000 of the alphas? And why would you not make them all alphas? Why would you not be trying to perfect the whole of the human race? Is the question. Ah, uh, ass, said the director, breaking a long silence. Hasn't it occurred to you that an epsilon embryo must have an epsilon environment as well as an epsilon heredity? It evidently hadn't occurred to him. He was covered with confusion. The lower the case, the shorter the oxygen. Because this is, again, they deprive them of oxygen, not just the fetal alcohol. They also... <laughs> and the first organ affected was the brain. After that, the skeleton, at 70% of normal oxygen you, oxygen, you get dwarfs, at less than 70, eyeless monsters, who are no use at all. 
concluded Mr. Foster. Note that utility, that of modest proposal, is the primary consideration. Last time I talked about um, the prison, uh, the panopticon developed by a utilitarian. Greatest possible good for the greatest number of people. Right? Same principle at work here. The social scientist and the scientist working uh, for the benefit of human nature. We're of no use at all. Whereas his voice became confidential and eager, if they could discover a technique for shortening the period of maturation, what a triumph, what a benefaction to society. Consider the horse. They considered it. Mature at six, the elephant at ten. While at thirteen a man is not yet sexually mature and is only fully grown at twenty. Modern scientists will say that the brain fully matures at the age of 25. Okay, whatever. Same, same principle. Very long maturation process. Hence, of course, the, that fruit of delayed development, the human intelligence. But in epsilons, said Mr. Foster very justly, we don't need human intelligence. Didn't need it and didn't get it. But though the epsilon mind was mature at 10, the epsilon body was not fit to work till 18. Long years of superfluous and wasted immaturity. If the physical development could be speeded up till it was as quick, say, as a cow's, what an enormous saving to the community. Note that people now are, the, the, the efficiency in trying to gain the ultimate utility needs to be sped up. Everything done in the name of efficiency. What an enormous saving to the community. Enormous, murmured the students. Mr. Foster's enthusiasm was infectious. He became rather technical, spoke of the abnormal endocrine coordination that made men so, grow so slowly, postulated a germinal mutation to account for it. Could it be undone, etc.? Uh, they go on and they talk about the different ways. But all of these have the same end, which is to produce people on the, on the assembly line of humanity more quickly more efficiently, cheaper, in greater numbers, their identity removed from them, uh, being controlled, making them fit for the purpose of their conditioners. All conditioning was a aims at that. That, says the director sententiously, is the secret of happiness and virtue. Liking what you've got to do. All conditioning aims at that. Making people like their unescapable social destiny. That could be the motto of Huxley's whole book. That's the aim of the totalitarian, making people like their unescapable social destiny. Unescapable by what category? Well, by the elite that are ma making it so they can't imagine and it's impossible for them to escape that outcome. Same thing as 1984. There is no escape from this reality and making them like it. In a gap between two tunnels, a nurse was delicately probing with a long, fine syringe into the gelatinous contents of a passing bottle. The students and their guides stood watching for a few months of silence. Well, Lenina, said Mr. Foster, when at last she withdrew the syringe and straightened herself up. The girl turned with a start. One could see that. For all the lupus and the purple eyes, she was uncommonly pretty. Henry! Her smile flashed redly at him. A row of coral teeth. Charming, charming, murmured the director, and giving her two or three little pats, received in exchange a rather deferential smile for himself. What are you giving them? asked Mr. Foster, making his tone very professional. Oh, the usual typhoid and sleeping sickness. Tropical workers start being inoculated at meter 150, explained to the students. The embryos still have gills. We immunize the fish against the future man's diseases. Then turning back to Lenina, 10 to 5 on the roof this afternoon, he said, as usual. He's meeting up, making a rendezvous with her. I'll meet you on the roof at uh, 10 to 5, as usual. What do you think is going to happen? Do I need to spell it out? As usual. Charming, said the director once more. The final pat moved towards the others. Anyway. Um, and now, Mr. Foster went on, I'd like to show you some very interesting condition for Alpha Plus intellectuals. We have a big batch of them on rack five. First gallery level, he called the two boys who had started to go down to the ground floor. 
They're around meter 900, he explained. You can't really do any useful intellectual conditioning till the fetuses have lost their tails. Follow me. But the director had looked at his watch. Ten to three, he said. No time for the intellectual embryos, I'm afraid. We must go up to the nurseries before the children have finished their afternoon sleep. Mr. Foster was disappointed. At least one glance at the decanting room, he pleaded. Very well, then, the director smiled indulgently. Just one glance. And what would we get? Neo-Pavlovian conditioning rooms. Pavlov, yes. So this is Neo-Pavlovian. It's conditioning even before they're born. So they, again, they come out and they're perfectly happy at what they're going to have to do. Now, what we will find here is that the different types of people do different have different occupations. The epsilons do the grunt work and they're very happy with it. They don't have, to, it's mindless, well, so are they. And, that, that, and they're useful for that end. Very pleased with that. So the alphas are bred to be the leaders, the epsilons are bred to be do menial labor. And there's effectively very little co in common between them. And, and this is part, again, of the assault on human nature, which I think Huxley is rightly seeing in the modern scientific approach to the humanities. It sees people in terms of groups, but not as bearers of the Imago Dei. Right? That's in Genesis uh, 1, it talks about man being made in the image of God, right? Male and female. We have no sense of that here whatsoever. There's no mention of God. There's no sense that an, an individual bears the image of God. There's no sense of the value on human life, which is contained in um, the prohibition against murder or adultery or stealing. No sense of the importance of private property, right? Again, stealing. Um, presumes that you have property that belongs to you. Even though the earth is the Lord, still as an individual, you have certain, there's a certain integrity. There's no sense of the importance of the family in this. All of these things are attack, attacks on the view of human nature that the Bible speaks of in all ancient societies, uh, acknowledge at least implicitly. C.S. Lewis calls it the Tao, by the way, that view of human nature, which every society, every major religion agrees upon. He calls it the Tao, T-A-O. And it's just the idea that humanity has a moral nature, a, universal, a universally uh, acknowledged moral nature. In Brave New World, they explicitly and implicitly deny it all over the place. Uh, I got two minutes. So I just want to say this. As a critique of this, I mean, this course is a course in literature, obviously, introducing you to the novel here. Important that we read it, but what is the takeaway is that what Orwell and Huxley are depicting here very much does seem to be describing not just a future hundreds of years hence, but very much a part of the world around us. The eugenics movement, what is happening to people, their loss of integrity, their loss of value as individuals, the, the aims of the elites often to condition people into certain actions. Um, these things seem undeniable, empirically observable. You can see, and whether you're Christian, non-Christian, they it, observed, um, both Huxley and Orwell, not Christians, but they observe it. So what's the Christian way of looking at this and how do we respond to it? Uh, it's one of the questions that I'm not going to be able to answer it in the class because it's, it's a big topic of discussion. The point at which you can start a critique is say, well, what is a human being? From a Christian point of view, what, what is actually a human being? What is the value of human nature? What is the dignity of a human being? How do we identify? What, what's the definition of a human being? Here, the definition is totally in the hands of the conditioners. I called it sadistic. Actually, I didn't call it sadistic. Huxley called it sadistic. He said it was the Marquis de Sade. And he said, I agree with you, Mr. Orwell, that your depiction of the boot stamping on the face, that very much fits what we're talking about here. It's contempt for human nature. How does a Christian respond to that if we're not just going to go along with it? And it seems to me at least upholding the dignity of an in individual 
human being is the uh, starting point and its essential bedrock. Humanity, every individual, male, female, black, white, whatever, all the different identity group things, doesn't matter. An individual is the definition of a human being, male or female. Actually, that's the thing that shows that they're individuals and in, even back in Genesis is that they're, they're, they can be individuals and yet different. How different is a man from a woman? Fair bit. It's not just for procreation. There's a real, there, that's an individual and guess what? That's an individual. And both of them bear the image of God. But how different are they? Very different. Very, very different. They need each other as well. Something also being said about human nature. It's not just individual, but there's a, a corporate dimension, a family dimension that also comes out of that. These are all going directly against this worldview that we're seeing here and is around us right now. Anyway, I'll leave you with that, but it's food for thought. Okay, good for now. <laughs>